Good morning. I hope everybody's uh, hanging in there. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to MIT this morning and to our incredible space here. Um, I want to just note, I've had some side conversations with folks about this building. And if you go to your uh, guidebook app, um, the team had put together a nice description, or you can access a description as to when and um, when the building was updated, built, and the, about the architecture. So I highly recommend taking a look at that. So I just want to note one of the most unique aspects uh, for those of you hosting these conferences in the future about doing a co-hosting opportunity is that r right within a two-day framework, you get to experience two very unique institutions with very different uh, characteristics, um, and yet we we live within the same, or we access the same food shed, watershed, air shed. We have shared, uh, we share a city, a river, a local economy, a transportation system, and we purposely tried to have you on this floor so you could also just get a sense of the of the connectedness that that we share. So the opportunities that we need to um, bring to our our dialogues, we have to remain grounded in our unique institutes, but, but continue to come back to where the opportunities for partnership um, lie in between each of us despite your location. Um, I also want to just take note that one of our choices of having this in the Media Lab is that this also provides, um, when I arrived at MIT last August, I did a listening tour and I came and met with a handful of folks, of, of um, researchers and faculty members here at the Media Lab. And independently they all said, you know, about, um, about 95% of the research experiments that they attempt to do are actually failures. That's the expectation here. And yet the 5% actually succeed. And that's the, that's the culture of, of this area. Um, I think that's a very different environment than we all tend to have when we're focusing. That sounds so risky with the work that we tend to all need to do, particularly with our operations uh, folks on campus. And so one of the, um, so just, an example of that, so the idea is that with that 5%, you're having a profound impact on society, though it takes those so many failures to get to that place. So some examples, I think, that of, of what has come out of the eLab include e-ink, which is the, uh, that's what makes the electronic paper displays that now power the Kindles that many of you probably have in your, in your bags today, and the Barnes and Noble Nook. Um, the, wor the world's first ankle foot uh, prosthetic. For those of you following what happened after the Boston Marathon, there was a lot of coverage of the support the Media Lab gave to, uh, to many, many of the survivors of that. Um, the Guitar Hero and Rock Band uh, pro program came out of the Media Lab. There's a great story around that in terms of the role of the students, not unlike the some of the videos that you saw from Kent Larson yesterday. And the one laptop per child, which empowers children of developing countries to learn by providing one connected laptop to every school-aged child. So, I mean, what a fascinating range of, of um, you know, of, of unique researchers just located within this, within this building. So with that, I think that's an interesting way to go into the day. Today we're going to be having two panels that Steve Lanou will introduce momentarily, one on metrics and the other on basically unleashing our thoughts on, on pushing boundaries. And so with that, I want to just um, pass this along to Steve Lanou, who I just need to thank again. He's really been the conductor behind this part of the conference uh, at MIT today, and he's the deputy director of our office here. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. You're welcome. Use the stairs. I have to tell people to use the stairs. No coming up straight on the, straight on the stage. So welcome, everybody. Thank you all. We've got a great day uh, ahead of us today. Um, we're going to be starting with our panel on metrics, which is going to be exploring uh, some of the critical questions around how, how we're going to be, begin to define excellence in measurement and communication of what it is that we're doing. We'll have a break after that so people get a chance to catch up, enjoy the view, and enjoy each other. And we'll have a reconvene at 11 for the innovation panel. And then we're going to have lunch. And lunch is going to be across the street in Walker Memorial. And there'll be a group uh, of volunteers in the nice uh, green t-shirts who will take people over to lunch across the street. And then coming back at 2 o'clock, we'll begin the sessions uh, for the working groups, which will be distributed between this space, the lecture hall uh, just outside that door, and the secret Silverman room, which is behind the silver doors on the other side there. So that will be a working group there. So uh, another detail is after the working groups, we're going to have tours. We're actually going to have three parallel uh, campus tours, and you have to choose one. 
and there's some sign-up sheet. There's a sign-up sheet out on the back table uh, out, out in the Winter Garden room. So after this session, uh, I encourage everybody to sign up for a tour. They're essentially ones looking at, um, we're hoping to, uh, you learn something about MIT uh, as well as sort of uh, experience MIT in, in, in person. The first one's going to be uh, about campus renewal and MIT's plans around reinvesting in our existing infrastructure. Uh, we're going to have a second tour looking at um, and a discussion with one of the lead uh, engineers about uh, designing a laboratory space, um, high performance laboratory space, a, a lead gold. And there's an interesting story uh, being told in, in that. And then also looking more specifically at a sustainable renovation um, and interestingly of the Great Dome, which is the iconic image that is MIT, um, a renovation of that dome um, in a way that was um, recognizing its historical significance, but um, bringing it into the 21st century. And you'll be able to actually go up and take a look at that. So again, sign up, and um, we'll give you more details about those at the end of the day. All right, so great, moving right along. Jan, I'm going to get people up here with you very briefly, OK, very shortly. So <clears throat> our panel presenter and sole cowboy here is Jan Sadlek. He's president of the IREG Observatory on Academic Rankings and Excellence, an internationally recognized ex expert in higher education policy, governance, and management, where Jan conducts research on processes of reform and transformation in higher education and science policy, organization of doctoral studies and qualifications in private uh, higher education, quality assurance, and academic ranking, as well, interestingly, the ethical dimensions of higher education, which is a fascinating dimension, I think, of our work. And then we're going to be joined by uh, an esteemed um, panel, who I'll introduce all of them here briefly. And if you want more information, all of their bios are available on the guidebook. So I encourage you to, to take a look for more details. But we have George Serafin with us today from the Harvard uh, Business School. He's an associate professor. In addition to winning numerous uh, awards for his work, uh, on how organizations integrate sustainability into their business models, reportings, and investing. He's been published in academic and practitioner journals as well as media outlets such as Bloomberg, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The Economist, and our favorite NPR. We'll also be joined by Javier Benyanes, Ben Ayas. Ben we practiced several times. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. Javier is the coordinator of I. RSU, a network of sustainability indicators in higher education at the Ibero-American Network of Universities for Sustainability. And he's currently the executive, direct, uh, the executive secretary of the Commission on Environmental Quality, Sustainable Development, and Risk Prevention, which I expect has an acronym. Uh, and that's part of the Conference of Rectors of Spanish Universities. And he's also the deputy director of the Research Institute for Higher Education and Science. And we'll also be joined by our own Nazli Chokri, who's a professor of political science at MIT, where she specializes in the sources and consequences of international conflict and violence, also sort of a new dimension to some of, to some of our work. She is the associate director of MIT's technology and development program, as well as the architect and director, I think, of a particularly interesting project, which is the Global System for Sustainable Development, which is a multilingual web-based knowledge networking system focusing on the multi dimensionality of sustainability. And so you'll actually learn what that means from Nosley later today. So, and lastly, we have Anne Kildall with us today. She's the founding sustainability manager at the University of Hong Kong, where she works closely with senior management, the facilities teams, and other stakeholders to develop comprehensive sustainability programs uh, for the university. So really providing that campus sustainability context so important to us. So with that, Jan, I'd like to Welcome you. Good morning. I'm going to be the first speaker, so I will take uh, the advantage of it and would like to thank Harvard University uh, for the wonderful dinner yesterday. And we could uh, really see the correlation between 
good cooking, good food, and sustainability. So thank you very much. It was really nice. Uh, nice. Um, I um, maybe a uh, one of word or uh, about my uh, background. You of course have the, the CV uh, already um, available. I spent more than 20 years in the United Nations system, so it was very nice to see the colleagues uh, continuing this work in UNESCO. I was chief of the section for higher education policy for quite a while in Paris, and later on I was director for UNESCO European Center for Higher Education, which covers higher education in the Europe region. In UNESCO parlance or UN parlance, region is include, Europe region includes uh, North America and Israel. Why I say this? Um, I also moved to academia back and forth. Uh, for, uh, because the issue of sustainable development at the days when I was preparing the first policy document of UNESCO prior to the first World Conference on Higher Education was not very present one. You know, it was the, something which we were, we were, of course, having in mind, but uh, preoccupation was mostly with access, uh, with discrimination, with funding. The sustainability was not one, not, not, not on the uh, high priority. I think that it's changing now. When I look at the present documents of UN, UN system organizations, it's changing. And I think that this is uh, something which you, probably your hard work has uh, contributed to this change of mind. Uh, I think that sustainability, in my uh, opinion, I am not um, uh, specialist in that domain, but I think it is a it's not only an issue of uh, uh, funding or organizational structures, but it's also a mindset. And this is something which I would say is, is a positive development. Um, my presentation I structure in three parts. The first one is about reasons why metrics, in my opinion, make sense in, is with regard to higher education, or if they even more so, they are necessi necessity. The second, about the forms uh, uh, as well as strengths and weaknesses of the metrics which we use in higher education. And the third one, I will share with you some of the, my observations concerning the use of rankings uh, for enhancements of performance, collaboration, and innovation in higher education. Uh, probably, as usual, I will run off time, so I will have to cut uh, of the things. But I, I think that my presentation will be made available or is already available on the, on the appropriate website. Well, why do we, in, why, in my opinion, uh, must pay attention to metrics in higher education? Already in the mid-1980s, Clark Kerr observed that the university, in the collective now, meaning higher education institutions, has moved from the guild-like status on the periphery of society to more central place as the wealth and the good functioning of nations now depends on the performance of higher education as never before. Once I came across a very powerful statement that in the future um, the, uh, the, the strength of the nation will not be measured by the size of the army or allocation of the defense budget, but by the strength of the higher education and innovation sector. There are also uh, this, those changes, the importance of higher education has been confirmed by the, what is important, also, not only in developed countries, but uh, I would say it's a global phenomenon, by massification. And massification is uh, uh, understood in the, here is you have a matrix, you can, you can, if it's, now we consider there is a mass higher education, which is, if it exceeds, 40%. Uh, there was a Martin Tro has made, made that taxonomy of uh, open, uh, mass, and universal, and he used this benchmark of 50% um, as a universal higher education. The half of the specific age group, typical age cohort, 1824 goes to higher education. Then we have a mass higher education. You see the uh, President Obama's administration has set up a target 60% of the age group to go to, to, to tertiary education sector. Uh, 
in OECD countries, the, the threshold is between 35 and 40%. Uh, of course, there are countries which exceed this 60%. Uh, South Korea, Canada has, uh, has made about. Which raises, and by the way, it's an important question. Where's the limit? Should it be 100%? You know, again, everyone uh, should go uh, to, to, uh, to have it as an experience of tertiary education, yes or no. The second reason why we need the metrics is because of the pressure on the public funding uh, on higher education, uh, as well as the, you know, if you, if you, if you, you need to count if you want to allocate the funds. And, uh, and the last but not least is competition. And competition is something which we um, have to live with. Um, it's not very much in the culture, academic culture competition. You know, it's, uh, we like to uh, cooperate. It's, it's much more comfortable with cooperation uh, than with competition. Um, very recently, yes, uh, I, I've heard a, a nice comp uh, comparison. What was the competition in academia? And he used, it's not an accident, it was, uh, it was speaking in Paris just before the Tour de France, you know, that we have a, this famous bike race. Uh, and he said, this is, you, I think that this is, this we, the phenomena can be described like this. You know when this, the bikers start uh, this, the, 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 the race, they cooperate. You know, nobody knows that you can, at the end, no one will win from the start to the beginning. Happens, but usually they work together. Even the competing teams are working together. But closer, closer, closer to, to the end, they compete. So those, I think that similar can be, can be identified also in, uh, in, uh, in academia. At the beginning, for a long time, we work together. And the end, we compete. You know, who will publish first? Uh, who will get the recognition uh, first? So I think that is, is a nice, nice way of understanding that they are not, uh, um, have to be adversarial from the very beginning. And there's a value in it, in my opinion. And then this, the second argument is that the stakeholders, uh, various stakeholders, uh, general public also, uh, want to have the, um, the evidence of what we are doing. You know, this, uh, somebody even coined the term that we are evidence-based society. You know, that's not enough to say to make a declaration. You have to give the proof. Uh, so it, it is, again, on the one hand, we are under the pressure to present the evidence. And on the other hand, we, uh, have, uh, we are under the enormous pressure. And I'm uh, telling about the whole higher education sector, pressure for excellence. You know, that's the, um, but I think the issue of the quality is, is nothing, nothing new. I found it in the logo of uh, the first act of the, to, to found the Harvard. There is one, ter one word which is already at that time, the concept of quality was not absent because they speak about good education. Of course, this understanding what is a good education is very, very we can interpret it in a different way, but the, the, the thing that they, it, is, it was good uh, had uh, already uh, been present there. Um, uh, Clarker had uh, coined a very nice phrase, which probably originates from the, another f politician's phrase, even the Clarker was in between. It was a politician as a, as a, and an academic. He said the following, higher education has become too important to too many elements of society and to too many people for anyone to leave it alone. So I think that this period, I don't believe the universities were ever so-called ivory towers. You know, first of all, there was not very much ivory in it, and it was never so isolated from society as it's sometimes being uh, presented. Um, well, now there is. I'm trying to to make a lap and to jump into the concept of sustainable development. How I see it, uh, there is an overwhelming recognition. Uh, that the issues covered under the same sustainable development um, uh, are one of those key issues which are 
which are, I would say challenge our time. It's not an accident that Park Ki moon had declared our time as the age of sustainable development. Um, there is also an understanding that uh, uh, there's no one definition which would uh, for sustainable development or sustainability. But there is one, uh, one thing which is uh, agreed upon is that it will require participation uh, of uh, universities. Why? Because in dealing of the issues of sustainability, uh, you need um, integration of insight across various academic disciplines. Uh, and as only university has this privileged position and has this whole panoply of, the, of uh, knowledge which is necessary for uh, to dealing with. Uh, sometimes, and this is something which, you, this is why I would say is that um, some uh, uh, link, but also at the same time is, uh, I don't see it as a, as a contradiction, that sometimes in some certain circles, uh, sustainability can be understood under the third mission of the university, you know, there's the first one being research, teaching, and the third mission, this is uh, relation to the ex world, regional, or global. Um, I, I don't see it as a, as a, as a great problem. It, it will be a problem when we go next step, you know, when we try to find measurements, you know, that's, 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 that's the, an area um, in which uh, the issue of specificity might play the, the greater role. Um, before coming to, uh, to Boston, I attended the conference uh, in Kazakhstan. In, uh, it was an, a conference organized to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the funding of the uh, largest and the most important uh, university in, in Kazakhstan. And uh, the topic of it, it was uh, combined with the third forum of Euro-Asian universities. Um, the topic was sustainable development. So I think that this is, this is uh, uh, that, that this, this issue is, is present in the world. It is not an accident that one of the last issues of the of uh, the very good, and I recommend to all of you uh, to subscribe to it, the, because, uh, particularly that is free of charge, World University News was entirely devoted to the issue of sustainable development and the universities. So with the series of very good articles, by the way, that was of, of course working the reference to your networks as well. So that's, I think, that's something uh, sustainability is with us for the, uh, in the context, and I, I put a note of it, that there's, this is our reality in this uh, global becomes local, and at the same time when the local becomes global. And it's a paraphrase of the old saying, think uh, globally, act locally. I think that this is something which Sustainability is, uh, will be, and I think it's good to see it in this particular case, but you can do a lot of things at the global level. Uh, you don't need to, and maybe even it's, it's impossible to think already in the global terms. I think that this is something which is, and you know, we are, we are social, uh, but we care about local, probably sometimes it's more telling uh, what is in our surrounding and, and, uh, area, what we understand, what we can see it in three dimensions, than the big, big issues on which we have, we are overwhelmed by this, by the size of the problem, and uh, sometimes might be paralyzing to, to uh, and lead to inaction. Well, on the second part of my presentation, I wanted to, to share with you um, a few words about um, forms uh, in which which are in the metrical uh, uh, format are used in higher education, particularly in the context of quality uh, and, and excellence. You know, it's just, there are not so many available ways of measuring quality in higher education, you know, as I'm talking as an instrument. You know. uh, I have found five, maybe four, it depends how you interpret them, 
First is accreditation, which is minimal standards. Even if what we recently have observed as accreditation come, becomes also the kind of the sign of the quality, particularly in the certain areas, like for the business education. You know, this, if, you, if you have uh, Equis, MBAR, you have not accreditation of the, uh, of the respect, respectful accreditation, but it's not minimum standard. It's like the, the another batch of quality. You know, so that one who has the two is better than the one, and the, if you don't have any, then you can uh, ask about the quality overall. The second one, which is very dear to university and is part of the, and is natural part of the of academic culture, is the peer review. Uh, that's, uh, that's something which is um, another instrument. The third one is benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking is, uh, you know, is uh, you have a standard, and then you have a possibility to look where you are vis-a-vis -vis the particular standard. Oh my goodness, fine. The third one are academic awards. And, uh, and the last but not least, uh, uh, ranking. Um, what are the sources of, you know, the, if there are metrics, when, what are the sources for, for, for uh, and I have it have particularly in mind, rankings. I have to go very quickly. Um, and this is something which I, uh, uh, which is important to keep in mind that uh, the dynamics of those development is uh, quite overwhelming. Uh, so the, the rankings are using, and they like it, to use it, uh, the data which is publicly available. You know, there's uh, uh, data which is collected by uh, higher education institutions by themselves, independently of ranking or not. Uh, the third uh, group of uh, sources of information are the, all the bibliometrics. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting, you know, if you look at the history of bibliometrics, this was not linked to ranking by no means. It was, uh, it was just uh, to collect the performance productivity of, the, of uh, academia. It was, uh, it was sometimes happen. You develop the tool, and then it is used for something, something very, very different. And last but not least, but which is very controversial from the point of view of the precision, is the surveys, you know, that's uh, the, the, the information which you collect specifically. Um, the problem with the, with the ranking is that it is, uh, at least, the, uh, and I have it particularly in mind, the international rankings. Oh, I should. This is why you have summary of what I was saying here. So this are. <laughs> There's a, um, there's a, for the time being, it's, it's, it's coherent. And, uh, um, this is the, 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 the uh, that is that for the time being, and this is one of the shortcomings of the ranking is that it's the mostly, particularly the international rankings are reflecting the, the research, they are biased, biased towards research. This is a shortcoming. And they give approximation of teaching quality. So if you, you argue that if the if the uh, if the faculty is productive in research, that is also um, uh, assuring a, a, a good quality of teaching. And basically, there is a correlation between it. You know, you here where we are, Harvard and MIT are good examples confirming this correlation. The problem is, is how to measure it. Oh my goodness! One minute. So this is, you have to go by yourself, probably, uh, what, your, what university teaching can do. And uh, probably there's an equally long list of what, univer what university rankings cannot do. And that is something uh, which needs to be kept in mind. Um, there, here are the quick list of uh, the rankings which are, I would say, linked to uh, sustainability in more organic and direct way than we usually think. And uh, for the first one, I'm sure that you are familiar with the, with the um, ranking produced by the University of Indonesia. I think that this, they have done the pioneering work in this, in this regard. In the, they, they, they use quite a number of, of indicators. I, I'm pretty sure that many of your, 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 your universities are participating in this particular ranking. Uh, 
there is a, uh, as I mentioned in my introductory uh, remarks, is that there's a, in my opinion, there's a correlation between sustainability and, uh, and the agenda and the third mission. And uh, there is a quite a serious work. I was involved um, as an external expert to, uh, to this project E3M, which was an attempt, first attempt uh, um, in European uh, countries to come up with the indicators to measure, um, measure a third mission. Well, I, uh, in my written text, I used, an, uh, a, a ref I used a reference um, from somebody who was involved in consulting the in IT companies uh, from the point of view of uh, efficiency. And he, he, he was confronted with the problem with many of uh, Rankers confront, the, the problem of measurements. And he said that if you have a, a kind of the goodwill and uh, whatever, however is complex the problem, you can find out the, the, the possible measurement for it. So uh, I discarded optimism. I think it is, can also apply to this particular area, which is sustainability or third mission. Um, and last but not least, the U multi rank, which was just, just, just published on the 13th of May, European uh, Commission announced the U multi rank. Why I mention it? Because I think that this is probably the direction in which um, uh, the issue of sustainability will be um, continued and would, uh, would be present in uh, university ranking, not necessarily saying that this is the uh, sustainability um, agenda, or, but by, by, I would say, osmotic correlation with the, with the other um, uh, issues covered by the third mission. Uh, uh, and, and this particular, in the last ranking, which in, in my opinion is not altogether ranking because they, it's not in the uh, presented, it, uh, the, the information is not presented in the ordinary manner, but in the sunburst. So you have, you have, you have a picture, it's a, it's a mapping of the particular institution, its strengths, um, uh, and weaknesses, but and it's not. But if you make an effort, I would say that after a while you probably can make the also in, uh, in the ranking. Uh, one observation concerning the uh, you, uh, green metrics is uh, as something which is uh, worthy to to keep in mind that the number of participating institutions, and it's a very young ranking, it's, the, it's only a third edition has been just published, um, that when it started in 2011, only 178 universities participated from 42 countries. 2012, 215 universities from 49 countries. 2013, 301 universities from 61 countries. You see the dynamics, is, I, I must say that it's an, an impressive uh, increase, and I think that the maybe number of countries will not increase, but the number of, uh, of uh, universities, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that it will go uh, higher and higher. Um, well, now it is, I've probably run out of time, uh, so I just want to tell you the That, uh, that there are several, several arguments, several reasons why, in my opinion, ranking can uh, be an um, instrument worthy attention in our collective effort to enhance uh, performance and excellence and searching also innovation. Uh, that's even the critics recognize that this information which is in ranking is, uh, is valuable. Uh, it is, uh, it, you, ha I, you know, any kind of the assessment creates tension. You know, you, 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 know, you have to, you, when somebody tells you, I will assess you, be it at the in individual or group or institutional level, there's a tension, you know. And that's so, so this is why the rankings are not so very openly welcomed by everyone in, in, in the uh, uh, academia, um, 
there is always always this um, almost hypocritical stand. Uh, I use this strong word that you you are very pleased if you are very high in the rankings, but uh, then you in the next. Uh, uh, paragraph you will criticize the ranking. You know, that's the, I found it quite a number of times when the, the uh, leaders, even of the institutions of, of uh, higher education, institutions which I would say naturally should be comfortable with competition, are criticizing the ranking. And then I go to the website, and on the first page of the website presenting the institution, they will find that where we are in the, in the, in the ranking. So this, this is, I use this strong term a certain hypocritical uh, attitude. And I think that that's something uh, which should be avoided, you know. If you, if the ranking is, and I will end with this, uh, this is the purpose of the organization in which I am the president, uh, is to uh, facilitate universities how to live with rankings. Rankings can be very useful, but can be sometimes misused, and I always say and repeat it, almost like a Chinese torture, it's irresponsible to take any decision based only on rankings. Um, but you can, you, can, uh, you can use it as an extra source of information, very helpful, very telling. The public wants this, this condensed type of information, despite of the, of the fact that it's a proxy. And it has to be understood that it's a proxy, sometimes proxy of the proxy. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that these rankings are going to stay with us. and. Uh, and uh, why not to use it? And it's very hard to draw attention of the general public with our uh, actions, daily work and daily, daily performance. But if there is a ranking, there's something, there's something which you can reach the public much easier than it's usually to do. So thank you very much for your attention. All right. Um. So good morning, everybody. I'm George Serfing. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and the rest of the organizers for inviting me to speak at this uh, terrific event, actually. Um, metrics. Let me just say that um, I'm no expert in any way on campus sustainability or actually in any of the university and academic rankings. Uh, one of the things about Harvard Business School is we actually don't use those ratings. So I don't know much about them. Um, it's, it's the nature of the school. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's related to some of the reasons why that Jan was talking about. Um, but I have studied for a very long time and I'm involved in businesses and on the regulatory side about uh, the development of metrics and standards around measurement. And basically I have uh, three objectives. I will take a short period of time and I'll try to borrow 90 seconds to Anne, who wants a little bit more time compared to me. Um, so, but I have three objectives. So here's what I want to do. I want to basically take you to a very kind of like short um, journey to the history of measurement so we can learn something um, from measurement of financial outcomes and non-financial outcomes that we can take it to our work here in the sustainability setting and on the campus setting. And then I want us to understand, like by improving metrics and measurement, what have we achieved as a society and what we have achieved as organizations. And then I want to make some remarks around ratings and rankings, basically, which I consider really important um, in this space. But at the same time, I will take a very cynical stance because I actually think they're, they're not very good. Um, so here, here's my point. Um, so if you study history, we have had uh, measurements uh, for a very long time. So actually, financial accounting goes back thousands of years. Um, some of them traced it in uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Some of them trace it in ancient Greece. And I'm originally from Greece, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, and, you know, for a very long time, we had pretty embryonic financial measurements. And then in the early 20th century, we started developing more systematic measurements and metrics around financial outcomes and trying to measure assets and liabilities and revenues and expenses. And we made tremendous progress, actually, since then. But that happened in the last 80 years at most, that tremendous progress. So for a very long time, we had some embryonic measurements. And we had that for a, 
for, for thousands of years, and then, boom, there was a point in, in time, in the early 20th century, that we made significant progress in advancing our ability to measure things. And after that, we created a pretty complex uh, accounting standard setting process and pretty complex financial measurements, and that allow us to do a, a few things. But what I want you to take from this is that actually it took a very long time for us, to, for us to, do, to be able to do this. So I find some people that are discouraged by the fact that we're actually not moving fast enough maybe at developing some of those metrics. Let me also kind of like give you the picture that it took thousands of years to develop what we have now. So don't take it for granted. We have an amazing, an amazing uh, actually toolkit in terms of like measuring financial outcomes, but it took a very, very long time and took significant resources from society to do this. Um, so that's one lesson. The second lesson is actually there was a lot of resistance uh, for this to happen. And you find that in the sustainability space as well. So many people will say, oh, those things cannot be measured, or maybe they are not credible, or maybe they are not worth measuring. So let me, um, let me say that actually uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US comes back and says, well, actually, we need to develop our capital market. So what we need to do is we need to have all companies that offer securities to retail investors like us actually start measuring and reporting on their sales numbers and their assets numbers and all these type of numbers. And there was a revolution. So the companies come back and say, what? We're going to disclose our sales to people? This is going to be the end of the world. So there was a lot of resistance. And you find that the same way with sustainability information. So that's the second lesson. It's, it's a struggle. Um, the third lesson was that actually the reason why we were able to develop such sophisticated measurements was because there was this combination of like strong regulatory pressure and at the same time innovation from market forces. And when I say market forces, basically all you people kind of like trying to find out how to improve processes um, that run throughout the campuses and as a result kind of like come up with new measurements. Um, so on the non-financial space, so when you are moving to the sustainability space, there has been, I think, a revolution in measurement and metrics in the last 30 years, and that has been enabled by visionary people like Alan White and a couple of other people that made the GRI and uh, such other organizations. Uh, but still, the, the stage of development on non-financial measurement is embryonic compared to financial measurement. Um, but if we are to learn three things about how we can move forward with sustainability metrics is we need to concentrate on relevance, reliability, and comparability. Okay, that is what allowed financial measurements to be used systematically in decisions from basically everybody. If you don't have relevant measures, and I will come back to that, if you don't have reliable measures that people can actually trust, and if you don't have metrics that are actually comparable, let's say across campuses, then you're not going to make much progress. So all this development and all this resource that we invest in the society, what it allows us to do? It allows us to do just two things. One, it allowed us to improve internal decision making. Okay, and you find that in the area of sustainability as well. I study corporations, so most of my examples can come from corporations. Uh, but what you find in corporations is that actually companies have found ways to measure sustainability outcomes and as a result save on costs, increase sales, uh, track better their reputations, improve customer relationships, improve employee engagement. So that's one outcome. The second outcome that it allowed is it allowed to ena it enabled basically market transactions. So by tracking and measuring some of those outcomes, it allowed to write contracts with suppliers or with customers or communicate with investors. And as a result, being able to, en to enter into transactions that they wouldn't be able to enter otherwise. Um, so thus, those have been the functions, you can say, of the measurements and the metrics. But here is the problem. Um, when you are producing a vast number of metrics, there is an aggregation problem. Because people 
have limited time and limited capacity to actually process information. I'm not a very smart guy, so if you tell me here's what the campus is doing and you give me 40 different metrics, I'm actually a ha having a hard time understanding you know, what should I do with those things. So for example, students or faculty members or other stakeholders that are interested in campus performance, um, they want some kind of like aggregated metric. And that gives the rise to the need for ratings, actually because it gives you that aggregated signal that then you can compare universities or schools or organizations of any nature. The pr so here's the problem with the ratings that I see uh, in general, though, so those are not just ratings about universities. I see problem with ratings in general. Ratings actually need to satisfy um, six principles in my mind. And there is some very interesting work that is going on from an organization that's called the Global Initiative for Sustainability Ratings. And I serve on the Technical Review Committee. So I, I am borrowing some of that work there. Um, so that work basically says that ratings need to satisfy six conditions. One is transparency. Actually, you need to be able as an outside stakeholder to understand what goes into the ratings, to understand like, what are you choosing on. The second thing is inclusiveness, basically. You need to be able to actually engage students, faculty members, or the relevant stakeholders in order to understand what you should be measuring and rating on. The third thing is impartiality. It actually it's actually a great joke that I make many times how, you know, like when a rating from a certain country comes, all the schools from that country like go up in the positions. Uh, materiality is probably the most important. What is it that actually students, faculty members, and all the relevant stakeholders care about on a campus? Like, I think, you know, those are the metrics that should go into a rating, the things that actually the immediate stakeholders of that campus care about. The fifth, uh, the fifth thing is comprehensiveness. It needs to be able to address all relevant different dimensions of sustainability that are actually relevant to those stakeholders. And the sixth thing that is actually pretty important and leaks back to reliability that I talked in the beginning is assurability. Two different, two different independent observers should be able to reach the same outcome through their own means. And if they cannot, then actually there is very little trust in the data, there is very little trust in the ranking. And as a result, me as an outside stakeholder, I won't change my decision making based on that rating. With that, I'm sorry for not saving those nine seconds. Thank you very much. Good morning. I hope my presentation. Thank you, Vern, for inviting me to the conference and thank you, Steve, for your presentation. I try to uh, 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 present to you uh, the uh, two projects, two different projects uh, of, uh, about the evaluation of uh, sustainability in the university from Spain and from Latin American countries. I try in 10 minutes. I think <laughs> I, I can. Uh, the, the first of the... Of the uh, yeah, the first of the, of the project is uh, from Spain, from the CRUE, the CRUE is the Conference of Rector of uh, Spanish University. In Spain, there are uh, 78 universities, more or less uh, 15 uh, are public and uh, 28 are private. But if you know, um, many of them are very, very new uh, university. Uh, in uh, CRUE, there are 10 commissions, and one of them are a work about sustainability. I am the, secret the general secretary of this uh, commission, and uh, in this group, we, we began to, to uh, uh, define an uh, 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 indicator system for evaluating the uh, Spanish university. This uh, project uh, was applied in, uh, in uh, 2011, and uh, we use or uh, we recollect data from uh, 31 universities, uh, Spanish universities, more or less, it's 62 percent of all the uh, public universities in Spain. Uh, for recollect the, the data or for design the, the system, we um, identified three uh, main areas and 12 uh, different fields. For uh, every, more or less every, every field has uh, 10 indicators. Uh, we began to work with 300 indicators, so many, but at the end we worked with 200. 
I, after the, the 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 end of the of the, of the study, we reduced to the last uh, system that is 176 indicator. Uh, why is there so much uh, indicator? Because uh, it's very easy to to answer. You need only to say yes or no. We uh, need uh, a lot of information about this. Uh, you have some uh, some samples in the in the uh, transparency, and uh, uh, we try that the people don't spend a lot of uh, time to recollecting the information. Uh, what is uh, the mm, what of the, the in the process? Uh, one of the main lessons that we learn. The first is when you send a questionnaire in uh, at a university. The university try to, uh, to answer that all the things are fine in, in his university. You need to introduce a, a, a phase in, in uh, uh, some people go to the university and try to identify if the information that the university uh, sent us is, is fine, it's okay, or there are some uh, some uh, out uh, fine uh, to try to, to stay very, very fine with the, with the with the results. The other the other thing is what is the uh, outcome with the obtain we obtain in this in this project. The first is general information. Uh, we are the the the, the uh, date of every university. We can use this uh, date for to uh, design uh, ranking for Spanish university, but we don't like. We use this information. Every uh, university have a, a private report with all the, his, the information about what is his position in uh, I don't know in these uh, figures. Uh, in every uni university are. In, uh, in this uh, graph uh, for uh, uh, the different university, but the name the uh, university don't appear. Only the university that received the, uh, the report know what is his position in all the, uh, the university, Spanish universities in, in, the, in the study. For us, it's very important that uh, the evaluation process have a, a qualitative um, a result for the university. We uh, prepare a, a, a report for a AH university that uh, participate in the in the study. You are, you are the different points that are in this report, but we try to identify what is the good practice of the university and what is the uh, different uh, point that we need to improve in the next year. I think this is the, uh, the good practice that we uh, use the, the evaluation system. The other result uh, was to identify the, what, uh, what are the, the best practice in the Spanish university. And uh, publicize it in the web page, not only to identify it. It's the good thing is that every university can uh, copy the good idea that other universities had. We need to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, identify or to copy or to uh, improve the different ideas that the different uh, universities uh, prove that are good. Why no? It's not uh, that uh, only one university uh, have uh, uh, some idea that not applied to, to the other. For the direction in this uh, study, the first conclusion is that uh, the process of assessment of uh, sustainability in university is very important, but not for competitive purpose. We need to uh, work together if we like to progress together. The second uh, uh, project, and for example, is very good, the uh, idea out of the platform for performance of uh, in the, uh, evaluation indication, because we try to uh, uh, work together about the, what is the evaluation system that we are applied in different countries in the, in the world. The second project, um, also, we have uh, the possibility of the work also in ranking in green metric, and my, my rector uh, uh, asked me that uh, I try to coordinate to, uh, um, to uh, recollect the, the different date from my university, 
I think my rector is very happy with me because my university was in the 24th position. But uh, I think the rector liked the rankings. But for me, the, uh, one of the results that is interesting from the ranking is when you uh, work in evaluation in a, a cooperative process, the journalists don't, uh, don't, uh, are very interesting for this process. Uh, it's, it's a more internal uh, process, and when you have a ranking, all the uh, journalists like, and for example, this, uh, the main in, uh, notice in a new, in, in a Spanish newspaper, three pages uh, new, was when the uh, green uh, metric uh, appear in, uh, in, uh, in the society. Was was incredible, but it's, it's one of the, the things of the uh, ranking is, is, uh, is good. The other uh, projects uh, that we, we try to, uh, to explain in very, very fast uh, is with uh, Latin American uh, countries. Uh, Arusha. Arusha is, is an alliance of network. Uh, there are 22 uh, networks uh, in different uh, countries, f f 15 uh, countries. And now we are more or less 300 universities in this, uh, in this uh, uh, network. Uh, also, uh, Ariusa is, is, the, is the member of uh, GUPES for, for Latin America, and Mahez, uh, we are working uh, very close with, uh, with them. And there are different uh, indicator systems in, in the uh, Latin American countries. There are some in Mexico, in Brazil, Costa Rica, uh, Colombia, and uh, we try to uh, uh, work together for to define a, a common system of uh, indicator for all these uh, uh, Latin American countries. It's not easier. All the countries, the no Brazil, speak Spanish, but uh, every country uses the different uh, form, the, the word. And uh, we have many problems. We identified the indicator, but it's the same meaning for all the countries. But we uh, uh, identified, uh, we are working uh, now 87 universities from 10 countries. You have the different number of, of the universities that are in the, in the different countries. Um, uh, uh, 16 in, uh, in Mexico, uh, 14 in Brazil, 13 in, uh, in Chile. Uh, now we uh, have the system with uh, 115 indicators. The uh, first uh, response to or answer to the indicator is very easy. It's the same to the Spanish uh, indicator, only yes or no. But uh, we identify other way to work with in indicator. We have a problem because in the most of the uh, Latin American uh, university, there aren't uh, many uh, experience in sustainability. And if we, I send the questionnaire to the university, you all try to, uh, to uh, sign no to every uh, indicator, it's not interesting uh, to, to have this evaluation. The rest is fine, but a uh, university that has a long uh, work in some, uh, in some time, but not for university that are beginning on, uh, to work in this, in this area. For, res for this reason, we try to use the uh, system like a, uh, to, in, to prepare or to uh, uh, develop a plan, a strategic plan for the future. All the indicators that the people uh, answer no, we can choose if they like to uh, use this indicator for a new uh, uh, strategic plan for three or five uh, years uh, in, in the future. I, this is the other way to working with the with indicator in some universities that is very young of the art working in, with, this, uh, with this thing. I think this is uh, the way that uh, we are trying to, to work. Uh, I think it's more interesting that uh, the uh, process was a real uh, process that uh, the university learned about his uh, uh, results, of this, this uh, outcome, and no process that is uh, controlled for uh, other institutions out, outside the, uh, the university. And I finish, uh, I think it's the same idea. Uh, uh, to make a progress on the path of the sustainability, I st it is better to develop a collaborative strategy than a competitive strategy. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Up and down, left or right? Left or right. Ha, huh, yeah. 
Okay, so um, what I'd like to um, spend a few minutes on is uh, to begin with a reminder of the core concept itself of sustainability. And we all know that it is important, but we tend to forget that it represents a global consensus uh, on a global objective. Now, consensus is not a word that we usually associate with international relations or international politics. We usually think about conflict. The fact that uh, it's anchored now as part of international policy, uh, we don't have to worry about legitimizing uh, the concept. What we do have to worry about is protecting it um, and protecting it by demonstrating that uh, strategies towards sustainability need not necessarily be highly costly, need not compete with the basic finance of an entity or, or a university, uh, that a reallocation might result in, in improvements. Um, more important than this is that the Rio concept was a general framing. Uh, that general framing now has been brought down and has to be brought down to specific situations, specific conditions, and so forth. Uh, your uh, conference in the last few days and, uh, and, the, and the mission of, of the organizers is about universities and the sustainability of universities. Being a faculty member, I have to admit that of all the issues that I have studied related to sustainability, including uh, the, the last item on this, uh, on this um, uh, slide, the university per se has not been a focus of, of, of my inquiry. But on the other hand, I was, have become very much aware of being the target of the university's efforts and strategies towards sustainability, ranging from very small things like organize your garbage so that it doesn't go all in the same bin, turn your lights off, et cetera, trivialities, but it involved changes in behavior, uh, to the university being willing, the department being willing uh, to allow me or encourage me to teach new graduate courses on sustainable development or sustainability. Uh, the introduction and the modification of the curriculum itself is a phenomenally important part uh, of, of the challenges um, uh, at hand. And in some ways, this leads me now to the second bullet. Uh, we're all dealing with uh, the balancing uh, emphasis on the parts that we're interested in versus our image of what the whole looks like. Because what we want to avoid is the sustainability of our entity or our system, the system we're in interested in, attaining that sustainability by exporting the problems or the damages next door. Uh, we can call it externalities, we can call it efficiencies, we can call it whatever, but what we don't want to do is to create a sustainability dilemma for someone else in the course of trying to resolve our own uh, our, our own um, challenges. The, the, uh, when it comes to universities, uh, the, the added dilemma, at least on the curriculum side or maybe on the institutional side as a whole, is addressing sustainability challenges but also remembering uh, the emphasis that we, by definition, focus on, which is adaptation, transformation, uh, and change and how to manage change. Uh, so we're trying to manage a whole set of trajectories at the same time because the last thing we want to do is to equate sustainability with a form of static, ad static adjustment or static uh, adaptation, and, and we know that. On uh, standardization and, and, and comparisons, I went through uh, some of the slides that were sent to us about uh, one of the recent uh, experiences on uh, initiatives on, on metricization, and the first thing that occurred to me, should, I'm sure occurred to you as well, and, that's, and that is no one method or no one strategy fits all, that there's a form of diversification that's necessary, uh, and perhaps we should consider, in addition to what the previous speaker has, has mentioned, which is, I, I resonated with very positively, um, a, a clustering of types of universities or, or, folk, or, or uh, standardization um, uh, strategies that belong to, that are more effective for this cluster versus this cluster uh, uh, and so forth. Because ultimately, when all is said and done, what we're dealing with is managing the loads on the system versus the capabilities of the system to manage the loads. Uh, and that is, is, uh, is what, uh, 
the challenge is. I'd like to spend the two minutes and 45 seconds I have left uh, to draw your attention very quickly to the um, intellectual part of this, which is the Global System for Sustainable Development. Uh, this is the, the homepage. And what is GSSD? It's a strategy for organizing a lot of materials, your material that you would submit as an abstract, and then we would link to uh, your website. And users can do search over our database, which includes your abstract, and if they like the abstract, they will click back, back uh, to you. Uh, it has retrieval functionalities, etc. Now, the site is organized somehow uh, in this way, but there's only one item that I'd like to draw your attention to, which is the mapping item, mapping sustainability. And in our context, the subject matter is sustainability of the society, of the state. It's an aggregate level uh, of the economic sector uh, and so forth. And the question of well, what's the data that we're dealing with? What, what material? It could be concepts, theories, indicators, measures. This characterizes the form of knowledge or the form of publications or experiences that, for example, you, your work uh, represents. Um, there is an assumption we make here, and this is that uh, there are three important parameters, fundamental parameters for all societies. And if any one of them goes to zero, we're all gone. One is population and the demographic and the skills of people, et cetera. Uh, the other is the resource availability, uh, access, and the third is, is uh, technology, knowledge, skills, production. And you will recognize a similarity between this list and one of the slides in the previous uh, lists um, of the previous speaker. These are the topics or the dimensions of, of the sustainability material that we have. And then for each of the items, we then reclassify uh, let's say transportation in terms of what are the problems, what are the activities, what do we know about the socioeconomic solutions, and what do we know about the technological solutions, and the international responses. This is just a classification uh, um, format that allows us to look at dimensions and domains at the same time, but the organization itself, uh, but this is organization, but material content is not ours, it's yours. Oh, submission from others, and we curate it. My last point is something I care very much about and uh, anchored, it's, it's the core of our research. I've got 30 more seconds. And this is the, the, the importance from a research point of view, intellectual point of view, uh, to highlight the interconnections between uses of cyberspace, I mean more than the internet, as a support system for sustainability, strategies towards sustainability, and why? because of the joint features or joint characteristics of sustainability and, and, and cyberspace. And we're doing a lot of work on this. Finally, 10 more seconds, the Chinese version and we have, of the system as a whole, and the Arabic version. How many of you are Arabic speakers? Ha, one, two, great, and me, that makes three. Um, I don't have the slide here, but we also have this, a Spanish version that we've just started. Thank you. Okay, um, let me bring this down a few notches. I'm Anne Kildall from the University of Hong Kong. Um, and while this is coming, oh great. Um, let's start with just a quick reminder of what is driving the use of all these metrics in uh, when we talk about sustainability in higher education. They are government mandates. In the UK, for example, we have uh, government requirements for carbon target setting and action plans that those are often tied to universities' funding. There are a lot of voluntary drivers, drivers on campuses, so targets and action plans that are set by universities themselves. The many non-binding declarations and charters you know about, sustainability reporting has been mentioned. And as George said, ratings, rankings, assessments, and awards, which is really moving into our space very quickly. This is um, a list I put together of some of what's out there. It's never going to be complete because this space is changing uh, so quickly. Um, like mainstream university rankings and corporate sustainability ratings, the frameworks, these are ratings, rankings, assessments, awards, all lumped together, but they're developed by different kinds of organizations. So not-for-profit organizations, government back bodies, um, commercial media organizations, universities, even students in the case of the uh, Green League. And, you know, it's dynamic. So in development, we have a few more. Yaru is working on a system 
uh, the Korean universities, the Nordic Network, and I learned this week that uh, universities in Thailand and Malaysia are also working on developing their own metrics. And there is some kind of a, a consensus in this area. Um, they focus on similar issues. So the first five listed up here, operations and so on, uh, are in at least 15 of the assessment systems that I've looked at. Uh, the next two are in at least five or six, and the last couple, also important, are in a few of them. Um, each of these broad categories, of course, tends to include multiple sub-indicators, but the last two speakers have, have shown those for me, so I don't have to go into them. Um, this is a very dynamic situation, changing in real time um, and affecting all of us. Um, as more and more universities, countries, higher ed systems, nonprofits, for-profit organizations, and so on, become more engaged in this work, I think we're gonna see more of it happening. Um, there's a lot of variety in terms of the types of frameworks that are developing. They focus variously on local issues, regional, and as uh, Jan Sadlak pointed out, there's now even an attempt to uh, measure universities' greenness on, on a global scale. And of course, they're, um, like university rankings, they have different functions. So they're obviously tools for measuring our performance. They are um, doing that in different ways, sometimes with detailed checklists and sometimes through more qualitative assessments and approaches. Uh, like sustainability reporting for businesses, they also are a way to engage stakeholders. So this is a, you know, an educational tool. They're also educational in the sense that they can, um, well, I'll get into that next, actually. Let's not do that yet. Um, they have pros and cons. They are, of course, positive in the sense that they can awaken people's competitive spirit, right? So they can bring us all kind of to pay attention to these things. They can be an impetus for uh, new initiatives or changes in terms of our own sustainability work on campus. They are educational in terms of helping to bring awareness. Um, to sustainable issues and they can motivate people, sometimes who are not yet engaged in this work. So depending on you know, who you work with, this could be your leadership, this could be administrators, donors, funding organizations, potential collaborators in the private sector or in academia. Uh, and in this sense, the competitive side of this can be a good thing. Um, a lot written about organizational change, the roles of looking at you know, the best in a field and so on. These are, these are positive things. Are there also negative aspects to this? Um, we've heard some, some echoes of that already. Um, there can be, potentially. There is a risk, I think, that with all of this assessment and particularly the one-size-fits-all kind of global approaches, um, they can drive behavior that isn't necessarily productive uh, and can potentially divert resources away from what really matters. Um, and that's something maybe we can talk about uh, in the discussion time. There are parallels. Uh, already these have been mentioned. So mainstream university rankings, CSR corporate reporting, and also uh, uh, sustainability ratings for companies. So just for fun, um, a few possible scenarios. Um, the first one, the watch and wait, basically says, you know, the train has left the station. This is happening. It's happening to us. We're sometimes driving it, nothing we can do. Um, and maybe redundancy is good, maybe it's not a problem. Um, you know, and over time, the better ones will kind of survive and the ones that aren't so good will fall away. But um, this is really George's expertise, but if we pay attention to what's happened in business, we could be getting together a few years from now and reviewing the 100 or 150 green rankings of universities that have developed, you know, and that'll be fun and games, right? Um, the next idea says, well, hold on, wait, you know, whether it's UI green metric or something else, you know, maybe don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, maybe there's some good work and goodwill has gone into these programs and we just need to tweak them and refine them, you know, make them better. Um, that's another option. Uh, the third option is maybe a little bit subver subversive, but you know, it says, let's stop all this, you know, no more box ticking, no more long lists of indicators. Let's bring it back down to something very simple. And Javier mentioned presence or absence. If we go back to the, the issue areas, if we say take the, the first five and just say, okay, let's look at these broad areas and is your university focusing on these, yes or no? Uh, and maybe include a, a space for some qualitative input. 
that would be a very you know different approach than what we've seen. Um, Next, by quasi-mandatory, I have two things in mind. One uh, comes back to the corporate side again. Um, if there were a way that we could require universities to do sustainability reporting, either independently or uh, coupled with financial reporting, that could be a very interesting thing. The move in the corporate world toward integrated reporting is a really interesting model. It brings in a qualitative approach, and it's a, you know, it's a different way to do things. Um, the second quasi-mandatory approach would be to take the kinds of rankings that uh, Jan's organization, IRAG, is looking at and incorporate some aspects of sustainability into the major mainstream rankings. And this is, uh, we have some real advocates of this approach in the room. Um, Chiara Mio from Kafoskari is here. She's been a, a real uh, booster of this idea. And this would basically harness the power of the rankings because they're out there. Whether you like them or not, they're, they're very powerful. Um, and people think that this would be kind of the, the killer indicator. You know, this would galvanize, you know, activity around the world if we could do this. Um, and then lastly, uh, and this speaks to what Javier said, is, is a more um, network of networks approach. And this would be to sort of recognize the importance of context and to look at local knowledge and local awareness and resources and drive change. All right, how to do this last one in one minute. Um, last slide. Just a... Jan has already mentioned tensions. Whatever we're looking at when it comes to ratings and rankings, there are going to be tensions. So how do you account for the kind of diversity we have in higher education? How do you account for context? Quite difficult. Um, the second one, strategic governance. From where I sit, I think that could be the most important thing for someone trying to develop sustainability within the university context. You can have policies, you can have committees and all the rest. Unless you have support from your senior management, unless you have a budget behind this, unless you have members of your board or council who are willing to back you up, you're not going to get very far. Now, if you can find a metric or a ranking that can include that, you know, I'll be very impressed. Um, next, the, the prescriptive norms. This basically speaks to the box ticking. Uh, as we have seen in university rankings around the world, if we discover that in sustainability we are trying, working towards trying to do better in a ranking, we may find that we're working on what can be measured and not what matters. We may be teaching to the test, you know, coming from an Asian context, you know, this is very common. Um, so versus real engagement, and that's a potentially a problem. Um, next, transparency and pricing. George uh, mentioned several others, but transparency is important. If we are going to be ranked and rated, you know, it's important to know on what basis, what are the weightings, how, are, how is this being done? You know, is it going to be a black box sort of situation where we wonder how we come out? You know, I think transparency is important. Uh, almost done. And uh, pricing, we haven't really mentioned, but, you know, eventually somebody has to pay. So is it a commercial organization doing this? So they're going to take our information and, and spin off products, or is it something that's, you know, done by a university for free? Uh, and then finally, as a sustainability manager, you know, we don't have unlimited resources. It's an issue. So it comes down to, well, is your time better spent filling out surveys, you know, forms and so on, trying to respond to requests that can be a real distraction or working on real work. And that's, that's a tension that we feel you know, in this position. So thank you. So before we open it up, Steve, who is a boss, asked me to, to open it up with one question from me to the rest of the panel. And, you know, like, my question is going to be obvious, and then I want to actually ask a short question, Javier, because I, th I think he said something really, everybody said interesting things, but I, I'm wondering how he has done it. But any reactions to the other presentations from anybody, kind of like, before we begin and open it up? I have, I have, one, I have one question, one question. Um, I'd be interested in knowing if there is a compilation of case studies, short case studies of uh, um, interventions that you would consider successful interventions um, in, in, uh, on uh, sustainability in universities. Is, is there some place one can go to find those little case studies? There are some good sources. Um, the ISN has its own uh, materials uh, that have been collected over the years from members. There's also a very large organization in the United States, AISHI, uh, uh, which collects a lot. Uh, they have about a thousand members. 
Let me ask one question, Javier, and then I will open it up. How, how did you say start from the 300 indicators and then brought it down to 176, which is, which is significant progress because you eliminated yes. half of them. Can you talk a little bit about this process, how it came about? Uh, the first is, is to uh, identify what is the more objective uh, indicator, because um, most of them you don't have uh, information that is easier to obtain on our very subjective uh, information, and we eliminate uh, more of them for this reason. And the other, when we applied the indicator, some of the indicator, all the uni university uh, are uh, are very very simple uh, indicator. You don't have in, uh, information about this. Uh, if all the university uh, apply uh, use this uh, this indicator, I think it's not interesting. And also, it's the same for the uh, high level. There are some indicators that nobody uh, apply. I think also it's not interesting to uh, to use. This is the, the the way that to adapt the the system to the uh, specific uh, situation of every country or every uh, region. And uh, this is a process that they use for to to uh, reduce the the the, the three hundred to one hundred and seventy. Just, just a brief comment into it. I think that this uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe there was I'm sure there were studies uh, about institutional behavior, how institution, be corporate sector or universities react if there are too many questions in the questionnaire. My experience is when I was dealing with uh, at UNESCO that there is something which you will never get in a reply from the member states if this uh, number of indicators exceeds X number, you know. And from my, my participation in the third mission project, we also had this dilemma how many indicators and we were, had to go through the process of reduction from hundred something to less than 70 because we thought that um, uh, 50 is something which we would will be our target and we the method which we used was the Delphi method we we just circulated to the experts and uh, they they view you know with the full understanding that this is will be a reductionist approach and you will not never will have all total coverage of the of the such complex issue so i think that this is this we should pay attention to this one and this is something which is for everyone doing any kind of assessment the capacity of the willingness of the institution to respond i was involved in the u multi rank uh, project and uh, as a vice rector of the of the university and uh, at the beginning, there was an enthusiasm to participate, but when later on came out the complexity of response, the pricing issue, how much resources you can allocate to this, to, 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 to monitoring, there was a, there was a re rejection of that, and we had to withdraw from the, from, the, from the participation in this project. So I think that this is something which we would should pay a due attention that there's the capacity to respond to when we are measuring something. The measurement mm -hmm. is a one challenge. The another one is to get uh, participation of the institution to it. I think that this is something which is worthy to point out. Uh, I'd like to go back for a moment on the case studies. What I was really asking, and I apologize for not having been clear, is whether there's been an effort to metricize the narratives of the case studies and to transform those into some form of quantitative uh, uh, indicators for purposes of cross-case comparisons. If this has not been done, it's a terrific topic for somebody's project or PhD thesis or something like that. Because if the material are there, as you indicate, um, then it's, it's, it's a methodological challenge to do that transformation, but it's been done in other areas. You can open it up for questions from the audience. If you can identify yourself as you ask the question, that would be great. Yes, go ahead. I am Chiara Mio from University of Venice, Ca Foscari. Um, I have a few um, remarks. The first one, uh, I deeply uh, believe that we need to embed sustainability in existing rankings. Otherwise, we will have an end-of-pipe approach. 
So I think that all the institutions should push towards this direction. Otherwise, we, we, we will have the rector or the dean uh, talking similar like that. I am the first in this valid ranking, and I am in the last position in the green metric or in this stuff, I don't care. So uh, uh, deeply, I believe that we need to embed, uh, to embed sustainability inside the, the existing. What do you think about this? And particularly you, uh, Jan, regarding your position in EREG, what can we do about the comparability during time of existing um, metrics uh, ranking uh, for embedding sustainability? The second uh, observation I have is about measures. Mm, we are measuring a lot of activities. Uh, for instance, coming from Venice, uh, I try to explain to green metric people that in Venice we cannot use bike. It's quite impossible. We can swim, but we cannot ride a bike. Yeah, in the water. Yeah, in the water. But the water? Yeah, no. in the water. It's, but when you go out uh, off of the water, you have to a bridge, so it's not so convenient. And this is, I, I try to convince them, but it's a rigid structure. So comparability measures. I don't think that we, I, I, I agree with Anne, we are going deep, too much deeper inside indicators measuring how many kilometers of bike or bike um, driven or street we have, but are we measure really sustainability in this way? And the third one, I have two last. Uh, we are measuring very well environmental issues, but I am not sure we are measuring social issue. And what do you think about this? Culture is difficult to measure, and we are focusing on what is more easier to uh, measure. And then uh, the last one is materiality to whom? How can we, can we prioritize different issues? If we have a win-win situation, it's easy. But if we have a um, um, policy good for environment, but bad for inclusiveness of people, materiality to whom? How can we go through prioritization? Thank you. I think that that ranking um, is a young, relatively young phenomenon. I'm talking about global rankings because the national rankings, US World News Report is already quite a long story, um, is uh, basically responsive to, uh, to the challenges, to the new uh, lens, changes in the landscape of higher education. You, uh, Chiara, you participated in the last conference in London of IREG Observatory just in the mid-May. And uh, you see the topic of it was uh, correlation between employability and, and rankings. And it was quite fascinating to see how the large multinationals are using rankings in the policy of recruitment. Which I understand if you, there's a representative from the British Petroleum was saying that each year, they receive 100,000 of applications for 700 openings. And in order to have a pre-selection, they, 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 they look at into rankings. But the, why it was the conference was, uh, uh, was uh, devoted to employability? Because employability started to be noticed by rankings. You know, we still have some problems, particularly the, to find the comparable measures at the international level, but the employability more and more enters into the domain. I think that the, that the sustainability will, it will be a next issue which will change, which will influence methodologies uh, of, of ranking in the near future. And this is, I think that this is such contacts as we have uh, uh, with your organization, with our organizations are helpful. I think that we are building up a certain consensus. There must be a pressure on rankers as well, you know, that's not, Let's put it this way, you know, and that's, that's something which I would, I would very much welcome, you know, this is, and I think that uh, I will report to within our organization, and I think that this slowly, uh, slowly there will be a building up of the pressure on the rankers to include uh, agenda of sustainability in the, in the way how the rankings are constructed. Good morning, um, Bernd Kasmir from the ISCN. Um, I'm also um, 
my second hat is sustain self a consulting company, so work a lot of companies and I can compare you know private sector and university engagement on this. I was really interested about George's comment and also Anne's comments about how disclosure is done in different sectors and how it works. And one thing that I think the companies, uh, the private sector has an advantage over us, they very clearly distinguish between transparency and disclosure. You've got the GI report, you've got some other kind of disclosure, like financial reporting, as a separate step from ranking and rating. So disclosure has transparency in the public domain, and then other people do rankings ratings based on that, be it Bloomberg, Dow Jones, somebody does judgment calls. Mm -hmm. But you can separate information from judgment. I like that. Mm -hmm. And I think in the university world, we too much mix up still disclosure and, and rankings. And I think we should be more precise about making it a two-step process. The second thing, and both George and, and Anne, you mentioned that, is to simplify and to cut uh, you know, through all the Multi multiple indicators, hundreds of indicators, etc. The corporate world calls this materiality these days. And they're very, very clearly focused on saying, yes, in GI there's something like 80 indicators, um, but only a few of them are really relevant to your sector, but also to your specific company, to your position in the sector. And what we heard yesterday from I think John Fernandez, if you cluster uh, universities and say, my type of university is like that, so maybe out of the 175 indicators of Javier or the, uh, I think, 50 indicators uh, in our ILCN reporting framework, only six are really important for us, and we report on those first. I think then we get clarity. And so distinguishing between disclosure and ranking and distinguishing between the menu of indicators to look at and picking those that are material, that are important. I think if we do these two things right, I'm, I'm very confident we, we can get forward. I th just to make a comment on this, uh, I, I think both comments are incredibly important, actually. Um, you need to separate disclosure from rating, for sure. Uh, because you get into that domain where you actually have incentives to disclose only good things if you are the person that actually kind of like constructs the ratings. So it creates all kinds of per perverse incentives. So as you say, uh, I wasn't aware of that in the university space, but definitely there needs to be a clear separation between uh, the entity that discloses and then all the entities that make any ratings. Um, so that's that's one. The second thing is, uh, you're right. Uh, there there is there is tremendous work that is happening right now on the corporate side in terms of materiality. And I think in the university space we can learn a lot from this work. Um, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board that has uh, that is actually making industry specific materiality maps uh, for U.S. companies is actually leading the way in terms of like boiling down from 100, 100 plus indicators to eight per industry, roughly speaking. And I think that is a tremendous step, uh, linking back to what Anne was saying. We have limited resources, and we have limited time and limited ability to process, and we need to be able to have the sustainability context that is going to guide us to understand materiality. And if we can do that in the university and the campus setting, I think that will be a tremendous way forward because 176 indicators might be the way of doing this, but I think it is also a very costly exercise. And I think that's where you get at this also boilerplate mentality of just checking the box. I think kind of like going deeper into 10 issues, it might get us more far away, but it's also, I guess, an evolution process. If we are at the university stage where the corporate stage was 15 years ago, then you know, 15 years from now, we might get where the private sector is now. So it might be a life cycle stage, but both comments are incredibly important. So since, think... since you study this, George, what can we do? I was gonna say we're 15 years behind. What can we do to learn from you that, that can allow us to save some of that time? We don't want to spend the next 15 years going through this, you know, proliferation and paring down and... Sure, I mean, so I think there were two things that were going on at the same time uh, and that allowed in this pro proliferation. One was that actually 
um, what I was discussing before in terms of inclusiveness a little bit and stakeholder engagement. So most of the corporations were not actually doing stakeholder engagement. So they were not identifying what's material for them. So they were like saying, they, so they were responding in some way in a reactive way. So they were saying, oh, there are societal concerns about a range of things. Let's just kind of like try and, you know, make some boiler state, state boilerplate statements about everything without addressing anything in any strategic way. So I think there is one was that. And the second thing, there were some perverse incentives about trying to disclose almost like some boiler statement, kind of like, again, disclose about everything, because that was the incentive from the rating side. So there was rating about uh, how much you disclose, independent of whether this is material or not. So you know, like I was, I, I was, I was having discussions with CEOs from banks, and all they would discuss was about their carbon emissions and not about the risk in their portfolios. <laughs> so uh, there, there is something wrong with that statement, right? Uh, yes, I want to know the carbon emissions of utilities firms very much so, right? And of oil and gas companies, but from a bank, from their buildings, not so much. You know, there, there are much more important things. So um, there was those two things, the absence of inclusiveness and stakeholder engagement. And I think then the perverse incentives that were created by this kind of like holistic approach of some of those ratings. I have, I have the mic, so uh, sure. I was if handed you have the it, mic, so go ahead. Let me do it. Uh, Jack Spengler, and I, I like this exchange that uh, Bernd uh, sparked among the panel because I would I got up to say I think we should push the big red pause button and learn from the 20 years experience in the corporate world of environmental social governance reporting. And it has failed to give the signal to the corporate management, the investors, the consumers, to sort this mess out. Every environmental ecosystem, uh, climate change indicator is going the wrong way after 20 years of this reporting process that uh, started after Rio. So the fact that, George, you're sensing that corporations are starting to reflect on this and, and recognize the discontinuities. So I think we should, we as a society, academic society, ought to go back to signaling theory and understand who we're trying to signal. Is it students? Is it our, is our, our university leaders? Is it our uh, alumni? Is it companies that hire and governments that hire our people? Who are we trying to signal? And figure this out and get the indicators right. And, Pay attention to what's happening in the corporate sector. The World Sustainable Business Council is working on this. Uh, the GRI revisions are working on this. Who else is part of this game of looking at the unification of the social and sustainability reporting to the financial markets? First of all, I think that this is a good uh, that we pay attention that and recognize the change in the in the in the corporate sector. I those who participated in the conference in London, I return to it. You would be probably uh, subscribed to it that how the corporate sector is well informed what's going on in higher education. You now that's the they the, all those multinationals which participated have their office on the relations with the universities, and that was that's one thing, and they. And that's something which I, I, I think it's in, uh, is uh, changing very much uh, and qu with a quite an amazing pace. The second comment, uh, a comment to the last speaker is, and that is a challenge for the university that is that they has to respond to multiple stakeholders. It cannot in our action we can only respond to the students only, or to uh, to politicians only. That is something which, uh, which uh, makes our existence complex. And by the same time, it, as I uh, opening remarks, I said, it's the university are just too important to too many, maybe too, too many, not to too many uh, stakeholders. And that is something which is uh, which a challenge also, particularly in such vast area as sustainable development. It's because we're running short on time. One more question. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Nader Ardalan. I'm at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. 
Uh, really, for the last uh, many years, we've been carrying out research on Islamic societies. I've had the pleasure of working, I guess, in thoughts with Nazli in some of these domains. One thing has really concerned me, and yesterday, in speaking with uh, Mahesh from the UNEP, he uh, settled something in my mind, and I'd like to raise it uh, because you're dealing with these metrics. The question I've always concerned with is, how do you measure the unmeasurable? That is, it's uh, relatively easy when you have uh, metrics that deal with things uh, such as, you know, energy, et cetera. But what do you do with world views? What do you do with cultural uh, look at life and ethics? And I was very happy that Mahesh said, Nader, uh, UN has now developed beyond the three pillars of economics, environment, and social, that we're now adding culture. And it's going to be done next year uh, through UNESCO, which is quite natural. And I feel that this is a domain that has been really missed because a lot of these prescriptions that we develop, which are sort of international, if they don't fit your social view, your cultural view, your ethical view, your moral view, it, it really doesn't go deep enough. And I wonder, since this is now a fourth pillar that is being added, uh, how are we going to be developing the matrix to measure such unmeasurable dimensions, but really important? Thank you. Anybody who wants to take over it? I, you know, so let me just make a comment on this incredibly important question. Uh, let me go back to my comfort zone, which is, which is corporate. I do think that we can learn something from them as well on that side, uh, because uh, one of the things that we know from, under, from organizational uh, theory is that actually culture is one of the most significant determinants of future economic performance. And that is the reason why many organizations have been trying to measure the healthiness of their culture and what culture means for them and for their individual circumstances and employees. Um, and I do think that it's, it's one of the domains that it's the hardest to measure, but it's one of those things that there has been progress there as well. And maybe, I don't know about that ranking that you talked about, but it seems like a significant step forward. And as a result, once somebody makes a ranking around an unmeasurable dimension, it's probably not perfect and there is lots of room for improvement, but that sparks innovation then in terms of us improving that rating. So it's a significant step forward. Uh, if I can supplement your observation to this comfort zone, which is my, uh, my past experience working for UNESCO, um, I by the bullet and tried once to deal with these issues and we organized even a conference on ethical and moral dimension of uh, higher education and, and science. And we came out that the, with a so-called code of good practice and uh, there's a, a, a so-called Bucharest declaration on ethical dimension of, of higher education. Uh, I think that this is something step by step is also possible with some goodwill to maybe not to make the rankings. I wouldn't do the rankings in this domain. I think it's enough what we uh, territory which we cover. But I think it's look at the at the corruption issue. Uh, that, 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 that is now transparency uh, indicators on corruption already entered into our discourse about evaluating of the behavior of the countries, behavior of the. Uh, of uh, the corporations. So I think that that I'm optimistic in this regard, but I think that this is something which is uh, not straightforward. It will, but we have to work it, and I'm very glad that UNESCO is uh, is, is going to to deal with this issue. So, but uh, that is probably one of the largest challenges. I'm not subscribing to Huntington's vision of the world, but you know the latest developments are not very encouraging. We are, to, oh, and this, the cultural mini wars or the cold wars or semi hot wars are going on. You know, this is, it has the, it has it has an impact also on sustainable development. You know, that the the war is not very, very positive indicator of sustainability. 
Thank you, everybody. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, it was a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you.